All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week so far. We are going to break down the return of Ben Simmons with the Brooklyn Nets as well as the Los Angeles Lakers making their first appearance in preseason with both LeBron James, Anthony Davis in the lineup, and Austin Reeves' first appearance with the Lakers. We're going to break that game down. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to do our season preview for the Los Angeles Lakers. They are up next in our power rankings at number four. So we'll do the usual routine of a season preview on the Los Angeles Lakers. And then I have two mailbag questions for the end of the show as well. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget about our podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. And then follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT. And don't forget, I need more mailbag questions. Keep dropping those in the YouTube comments. All right. So uh, in the never ending saga of Lakers fans trying to figure out who's going to start at the three between Anthony Davis, LeBron James, D'Angelo Russell, and Austin Reeves ended up being Torian Prince against the Brooklyn Nets. Now, doesn't really give us much clarity because Jared Vanderbilt, the guy who most of us think is going to start at the three, was out with heel soreness. And that might have just been a move to essentially keep Rui Hachimura coming off the bench like they will likely use him at the start of the season. So no real clarity there, but my guess is they're going to end up going with Jared Vanderbilt. The Lakers dominated. The starters did at least. Anthony Davis on the floor was a plus 16. They did have a unit they went to at the end of the first quarter with Christian Wood at the center with LeBron that got blown. Blitzed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but the main thing that was killing the Nets early on is they were ducking under picks. And this is a big thing that I'm confused about just from the strategy standpoint with Brooklyn. They're so athletic and they have so many switchable guys that have length and athleticism that can bother ball handlers. I don't understand why they're not opting to use more ball pressure. They were letting D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, LeBron James, really everybody settle into comfortable pull-up jump shots over the top of drop coverage in pick and roll. And they, like D'Angelo Russell in particular, got red hot at the start of this game. As a team, the Lakers struggled to make their pull-up jump shots against Golden State, but they were making them in a big way against Brooklyn. The Lakers scored 33 points last night just on pull-up jump shots. Even in catch-and-shoot situations, like you'd see Rui Hachimura or LeBron James come off of a double-wide pin down on the right side of the floor, and they were just coming up and catching pretty much unguarded and you know you'd see Spencer Dinwiddie kind of offer a soft closeout at Rui but Rui's just rising up comfortably into shots and so again like this Nets team doesn't have the offensive talent to not be a dominant defensive team so I did think that was interesting again it's early in preseason and we'll see over time there's been a lot of talk from the Nets players about how they want to be an elite defensive team but I wasn't super impressed with them last night they got lit on fire D'Angelo Russell was awesome like we said he got red hot at the start of the game. Now we've all seen D'Lo get red hot before, but he's been especially good in these two preseason games. And hopefully it's a sign of him taking that ass kicking at the hands of Bruce Brown and the Denver Nuggets last year, personally, in the work that he put in over the summer. He was very, uh, he talked a lot on media day about him working hard as a help defender. You're seeing some of that show up as he's positioned himself really well in passing lanes. He's gotten two steals just by being positioned properly as three steals total over the course of the preseason so far. But he's been awesome in pick and roll. D'Angelo Russell has run 23 pick and rolls, leading to 33 points for the Lakers so far in preseason. That's 1.44 points per possession. That's ridiculous. Really nice passing to the to the role man. He actually has decent chemistry already with Jackson Hayes, which is an interesting thing for bench lineups in the future. His pull-up jump shot's been helping. He's even helping in spot-up situations. He's three for four so far this preseason in catch-and-shoot threes. So again, just talk in pre- in pre at media day, but he's so far through two preseason games, D'Lo's putting his money where his mouth is. Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura both were great. Austin Reeves put in uh, put up 18. He got into a good old-fashioned shootout with Cam Thomas there in the second half, uh, hitting a bunch of threes. He's You could tell the confidence is is showing up with Austin. He had a – the first bucket of the game for the Lakers was a pull-up three in transition with LeBron running the wing next to him. Like, you know how confident you'd have to be to be at his age, dribbling down the floor – in an NBA game with LeBron freaking James running the left wing. And you're like, nah, dude, I got this. I'm shooting a pull up three. Like that. You could just tell all of the success that he had last year at the end of the regular season into the postseason, into what happened with team USA is flowing into the start of this season, which is exciting. Rui Hachimura put in 19 points off the bench. His catch and shoot three looks great, which once again is going to be a vitally important part of his ability to stay on the court, especially when they get into the postseason. 
LeBron and AD's jump shooting. This is the most exciting part of what I've seen from LeBron and AD so far in the preseason. Those two players have combined to take 16 jump shots so far, and they've scored 18 points on them. Seven points on seven shots for LeBron. AD's obviously been a little bit more efficient, but that's between the two of them, 1.13 points per jump shot. Why is that exciting? Because last year, LeBron in the regular season, 0.9 points per jump shot. Anthony Davis, 0.78. They were both bad jump shooters last year. Now, like AD, it's been several years in a row. LeBron, he has a couple of random years last year and then 2015 where he shot really poorly. One of the biggest questions coming into this year is, are they ever going to figure that part out? Again, really small sample size, but a good start. For the Lakers, if they get 1.1 points per jump shot out of LeBron and AD this year, that solves one of the biggest problems on this particular roster, which is over the pop, over the top shot making. Like they need to bolster their offense with rescue possessions and tough shot making in half court situations. LeBron James hitting a pull up three and pick and roll like he did in that first half. That's important. He had a one leg fadeaway out of a post up on the right block where he kind of like took that hard step towards the middle and then leaned back off one foot, knocked it down. That's over the top shot making. Again, like that, we talk about this a lot on the show, but rescue possessions and tough shot making and things like that. Those are the difference between a bottom tier offense and a top tier offense. That's the, you know, the three or four shots you make every game that the defense is literally giving you in a late clock situation or in a coverage situation. Those are the shots that could be the difference between you being elite and being pretty pedestrian on the offensive end of the floor. Anthony Davis has only taken two pull up jump shots so far in preseason and he's missed them both, but. He's making his threes. And I would argue for Anthony Davis, that's every bit as important as shot making because those are shots that defenses are going to concede. They're going to help off of AD when he's spotting up in the corner. They're going to help off of AD when he picks and pops to the three-point line. Him making that shot is every bit as important, if not more important, than the shots that even LeBron James will be taking over the top. So again, only two games, only preseason, a lot of stuff they got to prove over the course of the regular season and the postseason, but that's a good start. Uh, Last note on the Lakers in this game, Christian Wood versus Jackson Hayes. So these are the two backup centers that the Lakers signed over the offseason. And uh, so far, again, through two games, Jackson Hayes has just looked way better. The one lineup that didn't play well for the Lakers in the first half against the Nets yesterday when LeBron and AD were playing was that Christian Wood at the center lineup with LeBron James. He just looks significantly slower than Christian Wood. He's not running the ball super, running the floor super well. And one of the biggest things is, is, Jackson Hayes is a much uh, like a much more fluid offensive player for the Lakers. That doesn't sound right, right? Because Christian Wood is the guy that put up big numbers last year. But it mainly has to do with the fact that the four players around him have an easier time playing with him. Why? Because he's super predictable. And I mean that in a good way offensively. If you hit him on the roll, he's going to go up and try to shoot, right? If you hit him on the perimeter... He's going to quickly turn and run a dribble handoff going the other way to the other guard coming from the other side of the floor. As a result, there's a real flow to the offense when Jackson Hayes is on the floor. Right now, Christian Wood is being super aggressive offensively and trying really hard to get his offense going. And so he's catching and he's holding and he's catching and he's isoing and he's slower to make decisions. And it's actually kind of slowing down the flow of the offense. And then right now, Jackson Hayes is just a much more aware and engaged defensive player. Now, Jackson Hayes had a kind of a mixed bag defensively last year with the Pelicans. Statistically, he was one of the best pick and roll defenders in the league per synergy, but on tape, there, it was a lot of uh, high and low, and then he really struggled in switches. So like, again, j- like Christian Wood can make up this gap and he's going to need a long runway too, because he's clearly just, you know, learning how to fit in with this group in a way that Jackson Hayes is more naturally figuring out. Uh, so I, th- I'm not trying to write you know the death sentence on Christian Wood here in the rotation. That's not what I'm saying. And over the course of the season, LeBron and AD are going to miss him a- enough time that they're going to play a lot, both of them. I mean, they both will play together, th- and they and they did so last night. So like, all I'm saying is is that in the shorter version of the rotation, you give the advantage to Jackson Hayes at this point because he's better defensively and he f- flows better with the offense. And you see that on the scoreboard, by the way. The Lakers are minus 19 so far in Christian Wood's minutes in the preseason and plus 19 in Jackson Hayes' minutes in the preseason. So they're just better so far with Jackson Hayes. Uh, a lot of basketball left, but what that tells me is the early indications are that Jackson Hayes looks like a guy that you can play two shifts uh, you know, in an important setting as a backup center, 
there's some potential there. Christian Wood looks like a long way away from that, and he's going to have to take advantage of, of his opportunities the rest of preseason and in the season to prove that he needs that sp- that he deserves that spot if he wants his off- uh, offense to have a chance to shine through. Shine through, I should say. Uh, with the Nets, Ben Simmons. I thought he looked really spry athletically. He beat LeBron early on a drive to his right hand and scooped off the glass when LeBron tried to block him. He had a dunk on a run out, like a steal, uh, where he looked really athletic. Where The dead giveaway is like, look at the angle of the arms when the guy's dunking the basketball. If he's dunking up here, you know, he's, he's having to reach for it. If he's dunking out here, <laughs> that usually means that his head is up and around the rim. And Ben Simmons had like that that two-handed dunk in transition where his arms were out in front of him. You're like, oh, like he's getting up like he used to. Um, he took a little jump shot on the right elbow and he missed it long off the left side of the rim. But I literally just don't care about his jump shot. I mean, at this point, that ship has sailed. Ben's never going to be an offensive star. What he has to be for the Nets is the forward version of Draymond Green. He needs to be an athletic wrecking ball on both ends of the floor, a connective piece on offense that primarily operates running dribble handoffs and operating out of the high post as other guys are running action and he's distributing, screening and rolling hard to the rim, making plays as he's rolling to the rim because he does have the ability to finish at the rim and pass. And then on the defensive end of the floor, he needs to be the defensive player of the year candidate that he's capable of being as one of the most versatile backline and perimeter defenders that we have in the NBA when he's held. Healthy. But that's the key. He needed to get his back straight. He needed to get healthy to get near at least his former athleticism. And he looks at least near at this point. Again, it's early, it's preseason, but Ben looks very athletic and that's super encouraging. Cam Thomas, 26 points, took 12 jump shots last night, made eight of them. Six for nine on pull-up jump shots. And you know, one of the I heard the announcers talking about, you know, how Cam Thomas can stay in the rotation. And I don't know, like, as I look at the Nets roster, I don't really see a universe where he falls out of the rotation. I mean, once you get past Spencer Dinwiddie and Mikhail Bridges, it's a pretty big drop-off to the rest of the shot creation on that roster, especially with Ben Simmons' limitations as a shooter. And so, I mean, even if you do include Ben Simmons in there, Cam Thomas is unquestionably no no worse than their fourth best shot creator and probably their third best shot creator. So, like, I think he's going to play a lot. And, I mean, here's the thing. He, he, if he shoots this well, he's going to be an impactful player. I mean, there's a lot, there were a lot, of, there's a lot of talk on the, uh, on the broadcast about how he needs to defend to stay in the rotation and things along those lines. Again, like, they might not necessarily need him to earn a spot in the rotation just because they're going to need his shot creation. The NFL season is going strong, and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking new customers up with an offer that's even stronger. Bet five bucks on any game this week to score $200 instantly in bonus bets. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweeter offer every game day this October. There are eight games this weekend that have point spreads that are either three or smaller than three. Lots of good betting opportunities for you guys to take advantage of. Get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code HOOPS, H-O-O-P-S, only on the DraftKings Sportsbook app, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. All right, moving on to my Lakers season preview. So I have them at number four in my power rankings. Quick offseason recap. They lost Mo Bamba, Malik Beasley, Troy Brown Jr., Wenyan Gabriel, Dennis Schroeder, and Lonnie Walker. They added Jalen hood Shafino and Maxwell Lewis in the draft. And for you Lakers fans who haven't seen my uh, uh, draft scouting report on them, go back in my feed uh, to uh, right around the draft, and I actually did full scouts on both Jalen hood Shafino and Maxwell Lewis at that point, and then I did additional scouts of them at Summer League. So if you're looking for more content on them, you'll find that back in the feed. Uh, Jackson Hayes, Christian Wood, the two backup centers they brought in. Torian Prince, Cam Reddish. Torian Prince is, uh, is what I think is a really interesting option to have his forward depth from the standpoint of the fact that he kind of functionally operates as a three. Vanderbilt can defend like a three and can defend like a one, but can defend like a three, which requires what, – what do I mean by that? Let's, let's, let's dig into this a little bit. So we've talked about the defensive assignments on the show before, and the way I look at it, like most teams have two or three shot creators, right? And these are the guys that have the live dribble that are creating shots from the perimeter, okay? 
Then they're going to have dudes that they, they, they use primarily for defense that they're going to try to tuck away in the weak side corner as a, a way that they can try to not gum up the offense a ton. And then they're going to have a screen and roll either fulcrum or threat. So either a guy who comes up and sets screens and rolls to the basket, a guy like Nick Claxton, right? Or a fulcrum, a guy like Demonis Sabonis, Bam Adebayo, Nikola Jokic, who's going to actually be running most of the action uh, with dribble handoffs and screens at the top of the key, right? So as you match up with them defensively, you need a guy who can guard in two-man game, right? So let's call that Anthony Davis in this case. You need a guy who can guard the low man. In this case, let's call that LeBron James because he's going to be the guy that's going to want to rest on a lot of possessions, and he actually is at his best defensively in year 21 as a low man defender using his IQ and his ability to make plays at the rim defensively, right? So now I've got to guard these other three perimeter players. And these other three perimeter players are probably all shot creators, and so I've got to match up with them with point of attack defense. And so that is going to be different because now those defenders are going to have to navigate screens. LeBron is the low man, probably not going to have to navigate too many screens. Anthony Davis as the screen defender, probably not going to have to nav navigate too many screens. So bigger bodies do better in that position because it's more about dealing with physicality, jumping for contested rebounds, protecting the rim, that kind of thing, right? That's what those guys do. On the perimeter, it's very much about foot speed and quickness and the ability to navigate ball screens and cause problems at the point of attack. And so let's look at Rui Hachimura and Jared Vanderbilt. Rui Hachimura kind of fits more into that LeBron James mold. He's big, strong, good athlete, but he's a little top-heavy, not a very laterally quick player. So he can be impactful as a defensive rebounder, as a help defender, as a guy switching on to bigger players in general, banging with bigger bodies, right? That's where he can be most useful defensively. But if you ask Rui Hachimura to start running around screens, there can be some issues there because he's a big body, doesn't slide his feet super, super well, right? But then on the offensive end, Rui Hachimura does function like a three because he's been shooting the shit out of the basketball since he came to the Lakers, and he can attack closeouts and hit pull-up jump shots, and then he can also do some four stuff offensively in the post and duck-ins and things along those lines, right? So Rui Hachimura defensively functions as a four and offensively functions as a three-four, right? Then we look at Jared Vanderbilt. Offensively, he also functions as a four. He's not a guy that can run drive and kick basketball or reliably knock down shots from above the break. You have to either tuck him in the corner and pray he makes 36% of them, or he has to work out of the dunker spot where he can struggle. You saw that against Golden State when he had a couple of catches under the basket that he fumbled, right? And so the problem with Jared Vanderbilt is he is an outstanding perimeter defender. He does defend like a three. He can navigate screens. Actually, Jared Vanderbilt, in my opinion, is either a top tier or second tier perimeter defender in the league. That's how impactful he can be in that position. But he just has severe limitations on the offensive end of the floor. And so what I like about Torian Prince is he basically brings kind of like the genuine three approach. He's a guy who can knock down catch and shoot threes at a high rate and attack closeout so he can functionally operate on offense like a three. And then on defense, he's not as good defensively as Jared Vanderbilt to be clear, but he can navigate over the top of screens and provide back pressure. That's his particular strength defensively. But you saw against um, Jonathan Kaminga, he can get punished in the post. So he can't defend like a four, right? If you put a bigger athlete attacking him down low by the basket, he can struggle a little bit. So what I like about the Torian Prince acquisition is it kind of gives you a more well-rounded group of forwards. Now you've got two options to defend at the three in Jared Vanderbilt and Rui Hachimura, or excuse me, Jared Vanderbilt and, and Torian Prince. And you've got two options to defend at the four, which is Rui Hachimura and Jared Vanderbilt, who can do both because he's also pretty big and strong. So you've got a little bit more defensive versatility. And on the offensive end of the floor, if Rui doesn't have it going defensively and, and you literally can't play him because of a specific matchup where he's navigating screens too much, but on the other end you can't afford to have Vanderbilt get ignored, you have Torian Prince as an option. And so I really liked that pickup, especially at the biannual exception, which is an affordable contract range as just a guy who can just kind of give them more depth at the forward position and versatility in some ways that Rui and Vando have some holes. Uh, Cam Reddish, I don't expect him to play much this year. I think he is still a player who's learning how to play winning basketball and is far away away from that. But he will have his moments, and he will score points uh, when he does get minutes. And then Gabe Vincent, who I thought was a, a intentional move away from the Dennis Schroeder archetype, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, uh, kind of recapping the offseason, they also re-signed or extended Rui Hachimura, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, or Anthony, and Anthony Davis. And now, as a result, 
Uh, all five of those guys are locked up for at least the next two years, and all of them except for D'Angelo Russell are locked up for at least at least the next three years. So there's going to be continuity. There is security in the group of guys that's going to be coming to work every day for this team for the next few years. That's an advantage that the Lakers have lacked over the last few years with all the roster turnover that they've been going with. Now, there was a big kind of like narrative split in the public over what really happened in this Laker offseason. You had a lot of people saying the Lakers had a great offseason, and then you had a lot of other people saying, like, well, they didn't get any better in the key areas. And, like, the thing that's funny with that is, like, they're both right. They're just arguing about different things, right? So, like, you're right. Did they get better at the things they needed to beat Denver? Did they get more athletic in the backcourt and better at the point of attack? No. Did they get better at backup center? I mean, we'll see. Did they get better with shot making? Definitely not, unless LeBron and AD magically improve. So, like, did they fix those problems? No. So, I agree with these people. But the point is, is, like, those weren't really capable of being fixed this offseason. Like, they made a run at Bruce Brown to improve their backcourt athleticism. He was too expensive. He's 20-plus million a year. He went to the to the um, Pacers, right? They made a run at Brooke Lopez, they needed a legit backup center. They went after Brooke Lopez. They couldn't get him. He was 20 plus million a year. Went back to the Bucks, right? And then they didn't have the tradable salaries to get involved in the Dame sweepstakes or the Drew Holiday sweepstakes and probably didn't have the assets to get it done anyway. So like, if you really look at it, the, the magical top end improvement wasn't there for the Lakers in the off season, but they did improve the things they could do. They had the best offseason they could have had under their set of circumstances. They didn't get cute. They brought back all of their important playoff rotation players on affordable de deals. And that continuity is valuable, right? They brought in useful depth at positions where they needed it. Depth at forward, Vittorian Prince. They have two backup centers now. When last year they had one who got hurt in Mobamba, right? And one of which in Jackson Hayes has been winning his minutes in preseason and looks pretty solid. So, like, they did the best they could with what was available to them this offseason. Even the Gabe Vincent for Dennis Schroeder switch made sense to me. Like, Gabe is a downgrade at the point of attack by some amount. I still think Gabe's a decent point of attack defender, but he's a downgrade from Dennis Schroeder, theoretically, right? But it makes more sense on this roster because with Rui, or with Rui and LeBron and Anthony Davis and D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves, they actually need someone who's more comfortable playing without the basketball. And Gabe Vincent's just a better off-ball guard than Dennis Schroeder is, right? So I kind of like that move too. So it wasn't like some massive ceiling-raising offseason like Milwaukee bringing in Damian Lillard, but that wasn't available. They did the best with what was available. And they improved. I look at it as an excellent offseason for the Lakers on two fronts. They became a regular season, they became a better regular season team through continuity and depth. Right? And then two, they maintained flexibility if the right trade becomes available down the line. They have four salaries now between 10 million and 20 million that can be pieced together in any way to target a player. And they also have the depth at forward to where if they need to get rid of a forward, they can. Like if they have to use a forward as salary filler, they can because they've got two others left, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say, and again, Lakers fans love Rui. I love Rui. Maybe it all works out and he stays with the Lakers forever. That'd be great. But what I'm saying is, let's say a great player comes available in the trade market and you have to use Rui's salary. You can get to $33 million in salary filler with D'Angelo Russell and Rui Hachimura. And you can do that and still have Jared Vanderbilt and Torian Prince at forward for the rest of the season, right? So, like, some star guard becomes available that monumentally improves the Lakers' chances with shot making in the playoffs. And you can get it done with D'Angelo Russell, Rui Hachimura, and two first round picks. Now you have the ability to make a move like that. That is flexibility that they brought in this particular offseason with their strategy. So I thought that was a good strategy. Now, like again, the process from Rob Polinka has been great. The only real question is, and, and this is the thing, LeBron had his first real decline last year in the postseason, right? Now that was injury, but injury is related to age. He's now in his 21st season. If the Lakers make it to the Western Conference Finals again this year, LeBron James will be 39 years old, 39 and a half years old at the time of that series. So, like, the real question is, is, like, Rob's figured out his mistakes and he's rectified them. But did you – the the risk here was that, you know, LeBron's age 37 and 38 seasons basically went to waste, right? And and now you're in age 39 season, right? So, 
again, I want to pay the compliment to Rob for the excellent job that him and his front office has done this offseason and really since the Rui Hachimura trade last year before the deadline. But there is a, it's important to tell the full story, and the cost here is that LeBron's a lot older as a result. Um, but who knows? Maybe it'll all work out because of other improvements we'll talk about in a little bit. So the depth chart as of right now, at guard, D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, Gabe Vincent, and Jalen Hood-Shifino. At forward, LeBron James, Rui Hachimura, Jared Vanderbilt, Torian Prince, Max Christie, Cam Reddish, and Maxwell Lewis. And at center, Anthony Davis, Jackson Hayes, and Christian Wood. So obviously, a lot of depth at forward and center, which is weird compared to what they've had in earlier seasons. And they had three starting caliber guards, but they are a little thin at guard. Now, that's a good spot to be in because the three guards they have are all capable of starting for a legit NBA championship contender, right? But the problem is, is it's a big drop off to Jalen Hutchifino there. And, you know, maybe you look at Demoy Hodge there. Maybe you can play Max Christie as a as a two guard. But like it is a pretty big drop off. And so essentially, like, they are a little bit thin at guard. And that's something to keep an eye on over the course of the season, just from the standpoint of injuries. Like a significant injury to D'Angelo Russell or Austin Reeves could cause some problems for the Lakers with their lack of backcourt depth after those top three guys. Now, um, there are four playoff weaknesses that I see in this particular roster, and I want to dive into each of them for a second. So the first one is backcourt athleticism. Uh, Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell are both reasonably tall, right? Like 6'4", 6'5", between the two of them. But neither of them are particularly strong or athletic. And so they really struggle with Bruce Brown, especially D'Angelo Russell. Like, really struggled with Bruce Brown. Um, it was one of the biggest swing factors in that series. Bruce averaged 12, 4, and 3. But most importantly, he sapped D'Lo of his confidence. D'Angelo Russell scored six points per game in that series on 32% shooting and basically got removed from the floor by Darvin Ham. It was a big swing factor. And how did he do it? Because he was too big, strong, and athletic for him. On one end of the floor, just too physical at the point of attack, just basically taking D'Lo out of rhythm and sapping him of his confidence. And then on the other end of the floor, just straight line drives and semi-transition. Hard dribble moves to his right, knowing that D'Lo is not capable physically of sliding his feet and staying in front. Again, like the Lakers' backcourt is super skilled. Super skilled. But athleticism is not a strong point. Now, the counterpoint here is the Nuggets lost Bruce Brown. And I really like Christian Brown, but he's not as good as Bruce Brown, right? So, like, I don't think the Nuggets are going to be able to capitalize on that specific advantage nearly as much in this offseason or this postseason. And I don't see that as an issue with any of the other teams they really could face in the West except for the Clippers. The Clippers with Terrence Mann and Russell Westbrook could cause serious problems for the Lakers with their backcourt athleticism. Uh, but again, like the Clippers are too hard to take seriously as a threat because of their injury history. Um, so I'm not super concerned about the backcourt athleticism, but that is definitely a weakness on this roster. The backup center position. None of the Lakers, Lakers backup centers last year in the postseason were playable. Wenyan Gabriel is way too small. So he basically was just another forward. And LeBron basically ended up playing center. And then Mo Bamba, who sprained his ankle right before the postseason, and then when he was healthy, was not in a position to play. Now, will Jackson Hayes and Christian would be up to it? We'll see. Again, early through two preseason games, Jackson Hayes looks like the better option. They're plus 19 in his minutes. That's encouraging. You want to be positive with Anthony Davis uh, uh, off the floor, right? Now, some of those minutes were with Jackson Hayes, but D Jackson's played well, but it's too early to tell. So I'm going to put a big question mark by that one. The third biggest weakness of this roster for the postseason is over-the-top shot making. The Lakers were 29th in pull-up jump shot efficiency in the regular season last year. So literally second worst in the league. They also had a 101 offensive rating in the clutch in the playoffs. Not good. That comes down to LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Those two guys were awful last year making shots over the top of the defense. Look what happened in the Denver series. All those games were close, right? Three of the four games came down to crunch time. The, other, the only one that didn't come down to crunch time, the Lakers had a double-digit second-half lead, and really the Nuggets just did basically a clutch time blitz at the start of the fourth quarter, right? But what happened in that series? Every time the game slowed down, Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray were able to make over-the-shot, over-the-top, uh, <laughs> tough over-the-top shots, right? But LeBron James and Anthony Davis were not. That was literally the series. They were neck and neck basically the rest of the games until it slowed down at the end and then the Nuggets out-executed them every single time. Now, so far in preseason, they're shooting well, right? 
Um, LeBron and AD have taken 16 jump shots in, pre- in preseason and they've scored 18 points on them. That's well over a point per possession. That's really good. But it's early. And that's something that they're going to need to clearly demonstrate throughout the regular season and throughout the postseason in ordering to fix, in order to fix. Now, like, unless there's a personnel move, a, a specific trade to make, it's up to LeBron or AD. But certainly from a roster standpoint over the offseason, they did not get any better there. And then lastly, point of attack defense. Now, point of attack defense, as I've always said, is one of the most important parts of modern NBA defense. Because of the team spamming pick and roll and how good pull-up jump shooters are now, you need a guy who can navigate over the top of screens and bother players from behind so that your back line can be impactful defensively. It's vitally important. Last year, they had two really good options. They had Dennis Schroeder and uh, Jared Vanderbilt, right? But Dennis Schroeder was a little too small, particularly struggled with Jamal Murray. And then offensively, he was hit or miss, especially off the ball. Jared Vanderbilt was outstanding, like just an excellent point of attack defender, but had the offensive limitations that caused problems in the postseason, right? And now you've downgraded Dennis to Gabe, who is just going to be a lesser version of Dennis with the same small weaknesses, right? So, I mean, again, like if Jared Vanderbilt makes a significant improvement offensively, that helps to mitigate this problem. But even if that does happen, he's really your only guy. So this is a roster that has a significant weakness in point of attack defense, in my opinion. They're excellent backline defense and a lot more athletic than I think people think, but they're going to struggle at the point of attack. So in summary, it's backcourt strength and athleticism, athleticism, which I don't think will matter much this year. And then the backup center position, which I think the Lakers will figure out before the end of the season. And I think Jackson Hayes has a good chance. So it really comes down to shot making and pointing point of attack defense. Those are the two biggest weaknesses that could will most likely get them beat at this point. So the question is, is which is more important? Because they do not have the assets to address both, in my opinion. So if you could bring in a above average starter who is an elite point of attack defender or an outstanding over the top shot maker, which direction do you go? That's the big question. And to me, it really comes down to who the shot maker is. So if I was running the Lakers and we get to the deadline and those two options are on the table, it depends what the options are. If the shot maker is, let's say, you know, someone like Jordan Clarkson, like I don't think that's worth it, right? If it's James Harden, I don't think that's worth it. But if it's like, a real top tier guy, like let's say the the Mavericks completely uh, uh, self implode this year, and at the deadline, you know Luca gets hurt and and Kyrie's super upset and he just wants to get out, and you can make a move for someone like Kyrie. Hell yeah, you do that. Yeah, you, you'd find the salaries. I think it would it would have to take Rui, it would take D'Lo. You probably have to use another uh, contract in there as well. But like, you do that. But if it's anybody below that tier, I don't think it's worth it. And the reason why is you're not going to beat Denver in shot making with a mid-level shot creator. You're not going to beat Dame in Milwaukee with a mid-level shot creator. It has to be one of the guys. And so if you can get one of the guys, you go for it. That's why I lean more towards the point of attack position. Be great at what you're great at. Don't try to beat Denver at shot making. Don't try to beat Milwaukee at shot making. Beat them by being the best defense in the NBA. And if you get another outstanding point of attack defender out there with that front line and with commitment from the rest of the roster, you can be downright destructive defensively. I know the GMs all uh, uh, overlooked AD in the best defender category, but like he's the best defender in the league. How do you not see that by watching the postseason last year and everything he did in the second half of the regular season. He's the best defender. So if you give him real support on the perimeter, that's where you can go up against teams like Denver and be like, yeah, you're great at that, but we're great at this. Deal with it, right? That's the way that I would go about it if I was running the Lakers. Unless it was a top-tier shot maker at the deadline, I'd be looking at a uh, point-of-attack guy. And honestly... You don't do anything like that unless you need to. It's a judgment call you make at that point. If you get to February and LeBron James and Anthony Davis are making their jump shots and Jared Vanderbilt is 
a little more efficient from three and a little more efficient from the dunker spot, you don't mess with it and you run it with that group, right? It's a judgment call you make at the deadline. My prediction for this year, I think the Lakers are well positioned for a successful regular season. I think they will be a top four seed in the standings. Uh, in the West, barring like a catastrophic injury to AD. I think they can afford for AD and LeBron each to miss 20 games. They're that they're deep now. like, And they're deep at the important positions you need to win in the NBA. Like They're actually deep, young, and athletic in the front court, right? Like AD and LeBron can both be out, and they can run a starting lineup with Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, Rui Hachimura, and Jackson Hayes. That's a functional basketball team that has a real chance to win games, especially against bad teams. So you might be able to buy rest time there. They didn't have that last year. Uh, everyone on the roster, other than LeBron James and Anthony Davis, is in their 20s. This is a young athletic team. So uh, I don't think that LeBron missing 20 games or Anthony Davis missing 20 games is a problem. It's if AD has to miss 50 games, now we're talking about a much more serious issue, right? Uh, but barring that sort of catastrophic injury, I, I think the Lakers are going to be a top four seed. But in the playoffs, I think they're clearly behind Denver, Milwaukee, and Boston unless they have a significant upgrade. And that upgrade can come from two places. A, uh, an upgrade in offensive po potency from LeBron James and Anthony Davis, right? LeBron and AD improving his jump shooters, or a roster upgrade, either targeting a high-level shot creator or a point-of-attack defender. If they don't upgrade in one of those two ways, I think they're destined to lose in the semis or the conference finals again. All right, let's move on to the mailbag. First question. In your video a year ago, is Steph Curry a top five player in NBA history? You divided players into bigs and perimeter players. What changed this year, and why do you have bigs like AD and Jokic in the rankings with other guards and forwards? It's just really the difference between ranking all-time versus in the league right now. All-time, it's more about how we rank them with their peers, and it's purely for fun, right? Like, ranking them now, you're almost looking at it from the perspective of, like, a general manager. Like, at the end of the day, if you're picking teams... You can pick a center or a perimeter player. And if it's a better center, you're going to take the better center over the lesser perimeter player, right? Like you're going to take Joel Embiid over a, a guy like Jamal Murray, right? For instance. Whereas like if I had just guards in a list, you know, Jamal Murray's uh, going to be higher on the list, right? And, and, and Embiid's not even in consideration. So that's the thing. Like when Jamal Murray's career is over, I'm going to look at him and the way he stacks up to other two guards, right? But like in the bigger picture, obviously, you know, if I'm running a team and centers are available, I'm going to, I'm going to consider that. So essentially what I'm saying is, is that like right now looking at the league centers and players have to be ranked with each other, but in the all time sense, it makes sense to separate them because they effectively play different positions and it's really hard to compare them. All right. Last one. What team do you think will perform worse than the majority expects? This is a great question. Um, I thought really long and hard about this one. I have two teams that I'll throw out there. First is the Sacramento Kings. Uh, a couple reasons why. The, the West is insanely deep this year, and they got super lucky with injuries last year. They were the least injured team in the league last year. So as a result of that, I expect them to dip down into the bottom half of the Western Conference standings, finish you know, five, six, seven, eight in that range. Uh, the second team I put in there was the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, to be clear, don't take this the wrong way. I'm a huge believer in their playoff ceiling. But they gave up a lot of depth, and they're really bad at the point of attack. And so, uh, like any injury to one of their core four players, like if Giannis misses time, they're not going to be able to float the ship the way they did in the past. If Brooke Lopez misses time, they're not going to be able to float the ship the way they did in the past. God forbid Dame misses time. Like, you're going to really miss what Drew Holiday brought at that point. So, like... I, don't be surprised if there are several games behind Boston in the standings, like a solid five, six games behind Boston in the in the in the standings when we get to the end of the regular season. But obviously, I'm very much pro the Dame trade, and I think it will pay dividends when they get to May. I just think they made a little bit of a regular season sacrifice this uh, uh, this season for a postseason uh, increase in potential, and so. Again, I, I think the majority probably views the Bucs and Celtics at the top of the East again all conference. And don't get me wrong, the Bucs might still finish two. I, I just think it's more going to be like the Celtics run away with the conference and then everyone else is behind them at that point. All right, guys, that's all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you supporting the show, and I will see you guys tomorrow for some more preseason reaction.